I've only, I'd only, I've seen it once before and it was just on a little tiny computer. So seeing it up there today, with it, it had so many extra hidden bits and, bits and pieces that I hadn't noticed. So it was really quite exciting. From this morning I was in Westminster Abbey putting a wreath on my grandfather's plaque to mark his 60th anniversary since his death. And then I'm here to, tonight and I'm just really excited. Thank so, you. Yeah. So, well, thank you, Rich. Thank you, Anthony. Cheers, Anthony. <laughs> when, when we <coughs> first met, it was about six months ago, you both said to me quite clearly that you didn't want the film to be another biography, another documentary. The, the academics can get on with that next year. And you, you wanted it to be spontaneous. You wanted it to be instinctive, a real artistic response to my grandfather's life and work. Can you explain a bit more about what you mean by that and how that fed into the film? Um, well, that came about um, really because um, I'm involved in the Lang Weekend Festival and um, they applied um, to a uh, grant, which is the Dunham Thomas Winter Hundred grant, for money to do three extra festivals and um, for next year, which I'm involved with as well, sort of, in some sort of way. And, uh, and I thought it'd be. Um, uh, well, one of the festivals we're doing is a film and music one, so I thought it'd be quite nice to team up with a filmmaker to do um, a film, because seeing as it was all based around Dylan Thomas in it, um, around his his life and work really. And you know, I'm, I'm not uh, an expert on literature or poetry or anything really, so uh, it was quite a challenge for me to, you know, I, I um, to actually even think of doing a project like that really um, properly. But, uh, um, yeah, so it, it came about from that really, and then uh, we thought we'd just um, concentrate on the locations that he lived in um, and worked in in Wales, because when I did, started doing some initial research it became quite obvious that um, it was being in Wales and the locations and the people, and the people in Wales and the uh, communities in Wales that really inspired his work quite a lot, I think. And so we, we just concentrated on on you know Swansea Gower and Newquay and um, San Stefan and Lahn and places like that. So it turned into a kind of um, a bit of a sort of pilgrimage really to not pilgrimage but um, I knew that the visual images through the conversation with Rich would come from um, all of the places and some of the farms actually where family were from in San Stefan and um, we knew it was going to build up from that. And I think the hard thing was that we the the time that we were there it was. Wales never looked more like Ibiza. It was the sun was beating down on us. So there was no rain. There was no. I thought to take my fucking trunks as well. <laughs> but you can swim in the fucking sea. You, know? <laughs> you were camping as well, weren't you? I think it can sometimes be pretty unpleasant. It, 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 was, camping. it was very pleasant. It was the nicest film shoot I've ever been on, I think. But um, yeah, so we 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 were. At the same time as visiting all of these places, we were reading because we were we were kind of immersing into into his work, and we knew some of it from before. But every now and then, when we got back, I'd get a text from Rich at four in the morning with a quote, or and then something would go back, and it was just really excavating his work was was the challenge for us. I think. Well, we, we because we had quite a short time to do it, we immersed ourselves in um, in reading about his life and reading his work, and that, you know, which was a challenge for me because. You know, I've, I've barely read anything for about 14 years because my, my brain's fucked really bad. <laughs> um, but, you know, so I had to really concentrate. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it was great, you know, because uh, we, we'd, we'd go on these filming trips and then we'd stop for a lunch and have a coffee or something and then we'd just bring out the, the, the vast amounts of Dylan Thomas books we'd either bought or bought in the library and we'd just be sat in cafes and then we'd... Uh, it's like, uh, oh, did you know, you know, so we, 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 we just tell each other anecdotes about Dylan Thomas. So, you know, he, he went to Iran and uh, supposedly he was working for British intelligence, you know, the, all these little things came up. And so, yeah, yeah, we, we, we just immersed ourselves in him and his work and, uh, as, as much it, as we could. As it, because it sort of sounds sort of really quite a journey of discovery, really, because when we first met, it, I didn't know where on earth this film was going. No, I don't think they did either. <laughs> I did wonder what you on earth. Anyone, was. I, yeah, I don't think any of us knew quite what it was going to be. But I know, you know, that this is quite a new approach for you. The fact that there was no real direction, you didn't know where you were going, and was 
for me, I would find that incredibly scary, just not having any structure, not knowing where I was going. But in some ways, was it scary or was it actually quite liberating to just have completely c clear, no guidance, no rules, you just... It's, pretty, it's pretty much how I lived my life for the last 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, it wasn't. Like uh, <laughs> well, for me, it was scary. Then. <laughs> um, because we actually, lots of people didn't realise that we didn't know each other that well before we met once, I think, before, and it was Hannah that, that joined us up after your initial approach. So, for, for me, it was a different territory because really I was working at the beginning on a, on a silent film, which is, I found really hard to kind of think, okay, the recorded sound might be stripped and there may be something else happening and things went back and forth. So it was a, for me, it was a very different process to just arrive with the camera and then meet loads of people. Well, you've you, you used sound as a part of your work in the past. Yeah, yeah. Well, so I, was, I was sort of taking care of that. But yeah, we'd, we'd just, people would say, oh, you need to speak to, you need to go and speak to Big Bill down the road, so we would, and then you need to go and find... Chips Jenkins was another character where we would just then go and find these people, or and then the film would go off in a different, different time. He, he was the character I think because we were trying to look for people in Lan uh, and Sean Stafford who knew um, Dylan Thomas and his family, because his brother's family was from Sean Stafford. A lot of the images, you know, on the, on the, in the film from Sean Stafford. But um, someone in Lan wasn't it. Chip Jenkins and somebody said, oh, you really need to talk to him. He, he, here's his Facebook address. And I looked up his Facebook address and just a picture of a guy with a fucking shotgun. <laughs> just like a, like that address, you right. <laughs> Everyone in Lawn seems to have known my grandfather as far as I can. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> so, but as I, as I look at actually thinking about the film, as I watched it, I think maybe I've taken quite a literal interpretation of the film and, and tell me if I'm wrong here, but I s sort of got a feeling that you did it quite chronological, certainly in some ways, that you sort of looked at my grandfather's sort of childhood, being on the beach in Gow or in Swansea, it, it sort of began that way. And then you looked at the places he lived in Wales, so Clanstephan, Larne, Newquay. Um, and you sort of looked at the different environments. It was very much had, it had the landscape, the working environments, the pubs, and then it sort of took an. I felt it sort of took quite an ominous turn. You know, you had the bird on the north, um, and it sort of obviously maybe facing America, sort of heading off to his death really. And it, and there was a clock time passing, and I, I sort of felt there was some sort of chronological feeling. Or have I totally <coughs> got that wrong? My no, interpretation no, no, is wrong. I, 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 I think you know what, what we did was fairly instinctive, and what came up was fairly natural. I think. I think towards the end, you're quite right. I mean. I think you you know to just read his stories or his poems and you, you know it's all, always full of um, well you know an awareness of death <laughs> basically you know. and things passing I think was the, yeah, yeah. the the reason for taking the the day like the day from sunshine into that that twilight was to illustrate that sense and and stuff. And, and, and the book would that happens during the day as well in fact yeah that's actually something I just picked up again as I was watching it again on the big screen I did wonder if you're sort of taking the structure of under milk woods starting sort of with early in the day to tonight I don't, that's something I was again I picked up more and more as, as I watch it watch it again mm. yeah yeah it was, it was so, certainly like, and there's a there's a, the beginning of under milk wood with the, the line only your eyes are unclosed as if it's just just Dylan and the reader who can see everything but I kind of started thinking about it when in Clan Stefan somebody said, I saw you outside my window really late last night with a tripod. <laughs> and I thought, you know, I'm completely visible to everybody in Clan Stefan and Lan because I'm wandering around with this camera on my shoulder. So I was kind of aware that we were really visible where in Under Milk Wood he's kind of the only one who could see anything. They weren't rude to you. I know they've been no, quite rude to quite a few of the film crews around. No, they were, they were fine with us, yeah. Exactly. I think because we're the first of, there's going to be a wave of film crews arriving, and we were early on, so they're not tired to be kept. Yeah. You didn't stop the traffic or anything, or do anything there? No, we no, don't exactly. think Plus, we said we were skinned artists, and I think when they actually saw us at work, they realised yeah. what we were up to, you know, even though like a team of people in. Another thing that I noticed was a constant within that film was water. You know, you, you even had the bar staff washing, washing the glasses, and you had a, a boat going over the estuary. And I'm just wondering, was that, was that intentional to have so uh, water as such an integral part, the water and the sea as such an integral part of the film? 
I think it's, it's going back to what I said earlier about the places that um, he was brought up in Swansea, obviously, he's on the he spends a lot of time in the Gower um, area. And that obviously inspired him when he was young, and, uh, and every time he, he wanted to find somewhere to live in Wales, he always wanted to be near the water. Because um, someone got him a really nice house in the Gower, and he said, well, where's the, the nearest pub? It's like two miles away, that's, that's not fucking close enough. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, so um, so he, he always wants to be the, by the water and by a pub. Basically, you know. they'll be old, really. I mean, yeah. that's fair enough. Yeah. And the, and the image, the water imagery, kind of comes up. We had a, a chat with um, John Goodby who talked about how he um, saw the world, saw the body in terms of the world. So he talks about the Red Rivers when he's talking about veins. He talk, he really relates to the environment he's in, and all the way through, it kind of crops up again and again. The tide, um, seabirds, of course, because that's what was in front of him as well, and it was what was in front of us when we were there. Well, I actually noticed as well, as part of the film, you really had a lot of the natural landscape, so you showed lots of Clanstethan, Newquay, Swansea, and was that something, again, another, was the landscape something you really picked up in Dylan's work as you were, as you were researching it and looking at it? Yeah, a lot, lot of the images and the ways he uses images as metaphor, I think, uh, um, uses geology quite a lot, doesn't he, and uh, explain, tr trying to explain himself. Uh, we were, met the artist, um, oh, Ozzy. Ozzy Reese Osborne. Yeah, yeah. Um, I always mistake his name for Ozzy Osborne. <laughs> it's like uh, <laughs> that guy we've talked to in Milan, uh, Ozzy Osborne. No, he, he wouldn't know much about Dan Thomas, I think. But um, he might do better. But yeah, he, 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 um, he spoke to us at length about the influence of uh, geology and, um, and, ge and the geology of that area, you know, San Stefan and everything, and how, it would, um, and he, he, how, how he saw that and the influence of his work. And it's quite interesting talking to somebody like that and people like Jeff Towns and John Goodby, who are um, experts on his work and his life, really. And just to have that insight, you know, because I, I don't have that, that sort of literary insight because his work is layered with references to the Bible and. Um, Classical literature and all that, you know, which are things I don't really understand. You know. I think a lot of people, well, I think there's always been that dispute whether my grandfather actually liked Wales, and and I think you just have to look at his work and look at his descriptions of the sea and his descriptions of, <coughs> of the landscape to to think that there's just no dispute that he loved Wales and loved and that oh, those images yeah, really yeah, yeah, yeah. show that. And oh, no, I, I, I think he's like any, any other uh, right-thinking person who lives in Wales and is from Wales and have to necessarily be be from Wales <coughs> to actually love living here. You know, you, you do, do do get frustrated with certain aspects of Wales, yeah, but you still love being here. Yeah. And, and a lot of the a lot of the landscapes you could see are from. And we were working out well if he if when he was younger he would have taken the boat from Land to San Stefan and then having to walk around the headland. I mean, we followed a lot of the paths that. Are pretty much unchanged. I mean, the whole area is pretty much unchanged. I think so. They would have been the things that affected what he was writing. Mm. Yeah. And what actually? What <coughs> made you choose the title, "The Colour of Saying"? What? What? What made you decide that? That was another thing to choose. That. We struggled. We struggled for quite a while, with, and titles went back and forth. And as the film changed, different titles seemed appropriate. But I found, if I came across "The Colour of Saying," and it was the first time when. Um, something visual was paired with the sound, so the so, um, saying and speaking with something visual, and it seemed to suit where we were sitting with the film, where I was providing image and then Rich was revising it and providing the sound. Um, so yeah, it kind of fitted that. Because actually, when we discussed it as well, you said one of the reasons that you thought of the title, The Colour of Saying, is that we had a discussion that some people think my grandfather had syn syn synesthesia, yeah. which is yeah. when you see, um, when you might see words as a colour, so Monday might be green, or some people might sometimes see um, letters as they might want to taste a letter, so it's when all, you, all the senses get linked together. And from all your research and everything you've done, would you think perhaps my grandfather did have syn synesthesia? I could, I mean, like, it was a nice, because we talked about it, I think, when we first met, you mentioned it, and it start, made me start to think about um, whether that was the case, but he was certainly like hyper aware of senses, so colour, sound, smell, everything was linked, and he would swap um, adjectives around, and he would, there was a lot of wordplay where Lots something he would use yeah. to describe a sound was describing a period of time or 
an object or it's as if when, when he reads book he, he can't help himself to describe something as something else yeah, he's always doing it and it's, uh, if it's anything to i don't know if this will make you question things a bit differently my son he's four and he's already he, he says to me quite often um, oh, Monday's green, Mum, or, or Wednesday's purple. So, and that's what's made me think about it, seeing my son. So I don't, I don't know, but that's just something <laughs> that I'm wondering. I have lots of so, paper and a pen. So, yeah. see what comes out. As this, you know, this has been a real journey of discovery for you, and you've actually sort of, as you openly admit, you didn't know an awful lot about Dylan Thomas, you didn't know a lot about his work, and, and I actually didn't know a vast amount about my grandfather's work until about four years ago, and I've, I've really had a journey of discovery learning about my grandfather. But can you, can you what, what have you both discovered about Dylan Thomas through this process? Because you've really completely immersed yourself in, in his... Mm work in so many different ways, by meeting people, by, by reading his stuff? I think, I think we both got quite, as we found out more and, and dug deeper, we both got a bit protective. So someone in a pub would just say, oh yeah, the, you know, the, the drunk poet, and, this, and that, was, that was the line, was that this kind of widely held narrative that that's what he was. And then as, you, as you, we, we went deeper, we, you kind of find out more about his life and how, how structured and how much label was in each word. So you'd see a column of like crossed out words until you found the right one, or and then we're finding out things. I mean, for me, I had no idea that he was interested or even part of the surrealist movement in 1936. Yeah, I think so he went as a of ball of digging. string, didn't he, to the surrealist the exhibition? Ball of string, mm. yeah. yeah. Which he, sp he spent time with, with Max Ernst in the uh, Midwestern desert and things like that. You know, he was, he was going to do an opera with Stravinsky. Before he dies, and uh, yeah, I think the, the the opera was going to be linked to sort of the um, the nuclear war, wasn't it? And what could happen if there was a nuclear war? So yeah, it was based based on the, um, something apocalyptic, I think, what I can remember. Yeah, um, yeah, we, we just learnt a lot about you know and about him, and I learnt a lot about his work as well. Because I, I would just read his work and, to be honest, not not really understand it, but enjoy reading his work. But I think he wanted. He wanted his work to work on that level as well, that people like me could just in, enjoy reading it without really knowing the references and all the rest of it. Yeah. But then I got to learn a few more of the references in his poems, um, which, which was an interesting process. Because yeah. when, we, when we, certainly something you've said to me, Rich, when we've chatted before, you, you mentioned about Dylan's work being on many different levels. What, what do you mean by being on different levels? Did I say that? Yes, you did. <laughs> yes, you did. Oh, God. Um, I can't remember when I said it or why I said it. To I think what you meant, Rilla, was that you just um, that you can just gen an academic could really look into it and delve into it, but also someone else can get. Oh right, yeah. Well, I, I came across a, a book that was written in the early '60s by um, what's his name, Tyndall York. Uh, like the, it was the first proper sort of academic appraisal of his work, and um, there's only a bit of it on on the internet. There's, um, obviously, there's some sort of copyright issues, but um, but I, I read a lot of that, and that, that was really going into it in a very uh, um, layered way. You know? And um, I I never really done that since school, I guess. So <laughs> Well, I've, I've got one more question before we come and ask you guys. And Anthony said to me um, not to really, it, he's got quite a few of his family and friends here, yeah, and not to ask them. So if anyone, any family and friends have any questions. <laughs> but I, I think my final question really is um, do you think, you know, we, we talked about you discovering and learning a lot more about Dylan Thomas, and obviously there's quite a legend about Dylan Thomas, and there's lots of myths and things. And do you think, do you think all the myths about the drinking and womanising and all those bits of pieces. Do you think that distracts people from exploring his work? And one final thing as well with that, do you think Wales have avoided celebrating Lynn Thomas's work because of the legend of Lynn Thomas? Well, so also, the one thing I would say is that, is that the, the Irish only celebrate their rights and, and they're openly fucking, you know, <laughs> anarchists, basically. <laughs> yes, they're all the and the, the, there doesn't seem to be a problem with that, but I mean, actually, Dylan Thomas, you know, we had to drink, but I mean, I, I've read a few personal accounts of people who knew him in the different places he lived, and he wasn't, uh, 
you know, you just that much of a drink every day, you know. Yeah. And then you just bad Ben and Bean and something like that, you know. Yeah, I think, and, there, uh, I think there was a book that came out just a few years after he died, which I think really put the stamp yeah. of that, that, that was death the, on it all, really. Um, American publicists, wasn't it? John Malcolm, Brendan yeah, Young, yeah. Yeah. And I, th- I think we'd have, we'd have people coming up to us after a few pints, and they'd obviously had a few pints, in a pub, almost talking about him being a drunk. And I thought, yeah, we're all in the same boat here. <laughs> we're, all, we're all sitting in a pub talking about him being <laughs> drunk and we're sitting <laughs> drunk. He was nothing but a drunk. <laughs> <laughs> so are we. But I think it's down to you. If you're, anyone here has got any questions, I think someone's got a mic over there to come round and see you. But if anyone has any questions for Rich or... Anthony, really, or me, but I'd rather if it were these guys. <laughs> Thanks. It's not so much question, excuse me, it's not so much question as a comment. I thought what I, what I really enjoyed about the film, um, visually, was how there seemed to be a sort of correlation between the very like organic nature of the images, there always seem to be sort of, sort of fluid happening or, or some sort of life in, in the in each even the most static image. There'd always be something kind of rolling across the world. And, and to me, that that really came close to what I really love about Dylan Thomas's poetry is that sort of rolling, humming life. Um, and I mean, that's that's what I've got to say. <laughs> no questions, that's that I really enjoyed. Thank you. That, that actually correlates with what um, his friend uh, Daniel Jones, who grew up in Swansea, he wrote um, a preface to um, a version of Under Milk Wood, and, and he said that the most important thing for him about Under Milk Wood was the vitality of the, of the play and, uh, and the way he wrote. And I think, you know, that sort of correlates with what you were saying there. And actually something, sorry, it's not my turn now, but anyway, something, something I picked up and that my grandfather really liked playing with words and exploring and experimenting and I sort of felt that the, the film, the whole film picked up on his personality and picked up just how he wrote and it was a real, as it, you wanted it to be instinctive and an artistic response and I think it really got that. So we were, I think all the way through, from, from day one, I was kind of anxious that we would do something that was that was fitting for one and interesting enough to hold a cinema in in the room. Um, but what I was really encouraged when I found I'm going to completely misquote it, but it's a remembered quote about towards the end of his life, he was invited to go and um, with a cameraman, and they were going to travel across Ireland. And his his letter back said something like, "What a fantastic time we'll have just wandering and finding life and filming." And I thought that was a kind of seal of approval on us, kind of sort of on this pilgrimage and doing the same same thing. So yeah, it's that kind of we were aiming at. Yeah. I was in the, um, was it, I think it was at the, the fish cutting. Was it? I couldn't quite, see, yeah, I couldn't quite see exactly what it was. It was, it was that um, during, during the travels that we were on, and that I was filming, continually filming all these people by the shore fishing, and then our host, um, Steve, uh, caught a fish and, and he gets it in, he ate it for, for, the, for our dinner. So it was, it was a scene from there, which I kind of wanted to, it, it would have been, it, it was very easy to make a very beautiful film because I, mean, I was in beautiful places and I just wanted something to punctuate that dark to show what's happening behind, inside those lit windows as opposed to everything being kind of outside and looking towards the sea. So it's just that shift. I see. Yeah. 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 Ye
It's meant to be a contrast, but not, not a, yeah. a horrible, <laughs> old <bloody> contrast. <laughs> Just to make everyone wake up a bit. a question about the collaborative process actually how was that was it easy to you find a kind of like an easy way right at the beginning or was it difficult because you didn't know each other so it's kind of you know interesting. how did you find a kind of right through life to go on how was that just, just explain the process really from the beginning yeah I, I, I think it it started really early on because we were so we were four days walking talking camping travelling on a train drinking in, in, on the first trip and then those trips that followed so we really quickly we would have really quickly worked out if we didn't get on and yeah, yeah. Actually, we were following we were the we were showing the tent for fuck's sake luckily we got on you, know. you do still get on though. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, well, well I think so we get a bit better than everyone so uh, you know we like taking it so it was, it was a very slight choice by Hannah, um, who runs the family in chapter actually, who, who thought we'd both get on work, work well together, which you know, I think proves to be true. I didn't have a clue when I first met you that you hadn't worked together. It, it felt to me that you'd worked together for years. So. Well, that's, that, that, that's, that's what I felt when I met you. I felt like I'd known you for years already, you know, so that's what I think to say. Will you be working together again, do you think? Then? Never. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, hopefully, yeah, yeah, hopefully we'll be seeing us next year, yeah. But yeah, on the first, we met us, we would arrange to meet Central Station at 6am, catch the first train, both turned up in the same shirt, so... <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> Barry, I just wanted to ask about uh, Richard about the composition of music and the process of composing um, in relation to when you were researching, reading, mm -hmm. traveling to the places, and then of course responding to the images that Anthony was coming up with. What, what made it that work? I'm just curious. Yeah, that's quite, um, yeah, I'm quite curious about how it works. <laughs> um, no, um, because we had quite a short turnaround, then um, I just we, we just started reading immediately, and then we went on these trips. And then I write on guitar all the time, anyway. um, but then I, I went. I don't, don't have a piano, but I went to a friend's house to. I had um, three one-hour sessions on the piano. I knew that I was specifically writing for this project, and so I had all these Dylan Thomas books that I had taken out of the library, and I just laid them out, and just so I was immersed in it. You know. Um, whereas on the guitar I write all the time anyway, and then whatever I thought would thought fitted into the film, I thought uh, that, that, that I'd choose those tracks and then put them in. But when I was writing on piano, I knew that I was always writing for this landscape, this type of work, you know. And so uh, that that was a more concentrated thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, all, all I did really, and I think all, all I ever do, whenever I try to write for something specific, is just inform yourself as much as you can. So that not starts naturally for your instincts when you start creating things. And that, I think that's the only way that, that you're going to write something for something else. Yeah. You, you, you're always writing, it's not specifically for anything. But when you're writing for something, you just need to inform yourself and immerse yourself in something. So, so all that, that can come out is something related to that. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay.